Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. Today, we're speaking to the wonderful cast and creators of the uh, hit, amazing uh, Amazon Prime series, Them. We're going to kick things off by introducing you to our African members who are on the call today, starting with Carolyn Hines in Toronto, Canada, Brandon Collins in New York, New York, Anthony White in New York, New York, Karan Noir Kelly in Philadelphia, Dana Abercrombie in New York, New York, Derek Dunn, Derek, I forget your market, Niger Chambers in Washington, D.C., and Sam Leggett also in Washington. I'm going to let you guys do what you do so well, and I will see you on the other side. Imagine what might happen, what might be available to you, if fear was not an option. Are you ready? Ready to relinquish doubt and befriend your most actualized self? Are you ready? Wish your mama happy birthday before she goes to work. Happy birthday, man. <laughs> you say. Call came in just before 6.30 a.m. Detective? You're gonna wanna see this. Five fractures in all. Only bodies I've ever seen this broken were run over by trains. He's killed before. You don't start out this proficient at it. I think he knew his victims. Feels personal. This guy's left no eyewitnesses. Who could not be noticed? The last thing we need right now is a serial killer. Well, that's what we got, sir. Are you scared? Shabby. Do you not? understand what went on in here? No human is capable of that kind of evil. Did you ever feel like you can't breathe? Your heart is just gonna stop. You wanna yell, but you know no one believes you. It's, it's too late. It's coming. Fear was not an option. 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 You believe in God? Yeah, of course. Even with everything you've seen. No, I believe in the devil too. Hey, good morning. Anthony White with the movie blog from uh, New York. Um, this question is for Deborah and Luke, but anyone can chime in. Um, season one sparked some strong reactions from audiences with some difficult to watch, sometimes difficult to st stomach subject matter and imagery. Uh, season two seems to continue to show some challenging to watch imagery. I'm curious, like what's been the reaction of like, your peers, your your friends, your family towards the show in season one? And more importantly, what do you expect the reactions to be for season two? Um, so for season one, I mean, the people that I'm around, my peers, they really respected the artistry. They felt like it was very necessary, um, though it was definitely hard to watch for some people. It was necessary, you know, and, and for me, coming from season one, I understood it because I felt like there are some things that I've gone through in my personal life that it's hard for me to watch on screen, you know, but these type of stories, they're important to tell until we don't have to keep on telling them, you know, so I will always hold dear the foundation that we laid in season one. Um, and there are a lot of people that understood it. And I think that season two, at least the feedback that I've got and the, the what I feel personally is that season two will kind of bring a lot of things full circle. I think it will make people who maybe didn't understand 
why we had to go there um, for season one. I think it will make them kind of understand it in season two. Um, yeah, I just, I think the way, LM, the way that you just kind of continue to tell this story in a way that people can relate to is just beautiful. And obviously it being in the nineties, I feel like it just mm -hmm. makes it that much more relatable too and that much more reachable. Um, so people that felt removed from it in season one, the, fee the feedback that I got is they felt even more like excited about season two. And the same for me. I mean, I, I, I pretty, pretty much heard everything uh, once, uh, once people found out I was attached to uh, season two. Yeah, I mean, I'm eager. I, I, think, I think that's the beauty of art, right? Is to, is to ruffle some feathers. I mean, there's, you know, it's, yeah, in art, we love a little bit of fantasy, but something that grounds us, uh, it, it heightens the experience a lot more. And um, yeah, LM is a historian. So, I mean, I learned so much from season one and it took me on a ride. Um, uncomfortable, but I took the ride and I needed to know these things. I needed to know these things, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of us aren't privileged to our own history. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's really cool when 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 a creator can can give us a dose of that along with entertainment in a sense. Um, I think season two, I think, uh, yeah, it's gonna hit you over the head. It's horror, right? Get spooked and all of those things. Um, but I think you have a lot a lot more fun with it and and understanding what LM is doing, mm -hmm. the messaging. And I think it it just all comes together. It'll be full yeah. circle for sure. Yeah, I agree. Hi, everyone. Brandon Collinson and Medium Popcorn Podcast. My question is for Deborah and anyone who else who wants to jump in. So how did Little Marvin present this new season to you? And what's While we're talking you about this Little Marvin a lot, is he, yeah. on, the, is he, on, is he on the Zoom or is he? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But maybe he can, uh, <laughs> well, he can chime in. Some you can kind of sit there and take He's it. He's so popular. <laughs> I want to meet him. But I'm just curious. Uh, uh -huh. What surprised you most about the the direction that this uh this new season took, um, besides working with this incredible cast, which included the legendary Miss Pam Greer? So, uh, so LM and I, uh, <laughs> we had a Zoom, and we talked for like out for like what was it like over an hour, and most of it was actually us just catching up on like life, you know, to be honest. Um. And then he told me about it. He told me about the second season and told me about how he, where he wanted to take it. And I was just like, oh my God, you were actually mad in the best way. And then he was like, come to Atlanta and get to work. You were away. <laughs> He's like, bring your ass to Atlanta. Let's get to work. I wasn't even asking. Like, I'm, that. I'm there. That's literally how it was. <laughs> bring I your ass. Atlanta, let's get to work. That's what you want to I have to say, like, I, I can back that up. I did say that. I also, <laughs> uh, writing it, like, I was sitting down to write the second season. I, I was trying desperately to make myself see somebody else because mm -hmm. I just assumed that it wouldn't happen. And I assumed that it wasn't, I needed to think of another actor. I needed to think of another. And as I was writing it, the only face that kept coming to me was Deb. I mean, I've been calling her. She's the official muse of them because she's the face I see the first season. She was that warm beating heart of the first season. And she centers everything and grounds everything she does. And she's electric in that way. And so uh, I, I couldn't see any face but hers. And I was just, I was extremely grateful that uh, that she was able to do it. So Honestly, yeah. I was completely... I but I did really say get your ass down there. I did say that. <laughs> get your, get your ass down there. Let's, let's get to work. <laughs> Honestly, because for me, this is the first time I've actually returned to a show that I've been on. Um, everything I've done has been kind of like limited series. There's just one thing, uh, you know, a film or whatever. And this is the first time I've come back to a show. And so, you know, I just, I didn't, I didn't think that it was possible to kind of come back to a show and play a completely different character, you know, um, but in art, nothing's impossible, you know, and especially in the mind of LM, like nothing's impossible. And so for me, I was just like, this is sick. Like, this is an amazing idea. First of all, the time period, I love that time period, you know? Um, and it was just, I just was all over it, you know? Yeah. And then when you told me about your, 
Ellen, when you told me about your inspirations, what movies you were looking at, and just really wanted to recreate that like hazy LA 90s. You know, when you watch all those uh, uh, films in the 90s in LA, it's just that hazy thing that like, just, ah, oh, I was all over it. I was all over it. I definitely, I don't know if you want to continue. Sorry if I'm jumping in. I know, I just- <laughs> I'll, I'll try. I do want to say with what Deb just said about the '90s and about LA and specifically, I, 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 the, I'm, I find myself like I think a lot of people hugely nostalgic for that decade. <laughs> like, I love that decade. I love the music. I love the TV shows. I love the hairstyles. I love the style, the fashion. I love everything about it. And so the fun of getting to sit down with Deb and particularly like with our costume designer Lynn and yeah. like reference you know there's you'll you'll see as you watch it there's some really fun easter eggs yeah. just from a style perspective as you watch the show because I, we couldn't get you know Nia Long and 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 uh, Vivica Fox and Angela Bassett and Waiting to Exhale and Janet Jackson and Poetic Justice like the list goes on and on and on um, of references so it was really fun to work with Deb to create that, that yeah. yeah and I was all because the 90s style is just like if you look in my closet, like a lot of it is very 90s. So I was like this, 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 source, this, source, this. I was just all over it. So yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Carolyn for Carolyn Toss Podcast YouTube channel. Thank you everyone for joining us. So this is a question for everyone on the on the panel, all of the cast and um, um, LM. <laughs> um, so the thing with this show that I think is really going to really get a lot of people is how the mundane things of the 90s have been turned into horror aspects. You have mm -hmm. hip hop music is being turned into cues for very horrific scenes, you know, the dancing in the um those giant costumes. I've always hated them. Like I hate clowns. And mm -hmm. like turning those kind of things into like um how have it given a horror aspect. The auditioning for actors is kind of a horrific event where like for Luke's character, it stresses him out. <laughs> and you know, and like for um for Deborah, your character, lucky she's a cop, but like in listening to her own voice and recounting the things that she sees, that's horrific for her. And Joshua, you are caught up in drumming in the room with the with the hair, headphones on. And for Pam, your character, like you two were in this house in alone most of the time. And like the silence is hard, is pressing, is very oppressive. So I want all of you, um, first beginning with you, Ali, I'm talking about the mundane things in the 90s and everything around you in your home, kind of taking on a horror cue, or having a, a kind of like a stressful component to it. Because, hey, like, listen, hip hop turned into stressful cues. Like, how dare you do that? Like, what? Ah, <laughs> sacrilege. Uh, <laughs> I will say when you say you referenced the, uh, the mundanity of auditioning in the 90s. Let me tell you, I was a largely out of work actor in the 90s, mm -hmm. uh, primarily out of work. And that audition scene for me is extremely personal because I <laughs> had it <laughs> many, many times over. In fact, it's actually hilarious. You'll never see it, but I just have to say our production designer, David Bachelor Wilson, who was brilliant and, and designed all of our sets, he didn't tell me, and I'm watching this, sh this scene where Luke is uh, auditioning in the casting office and there's this wall of headshots. <laughs> and I'm like, what is that? What is that? And then I look and he put, he found my headshot from the nineties and put <laughs> it on the wall. So it's actually in the scene, which is a lovely and horrifying full circle moment. <laughs> uh, uh, but yes, uh, the, the 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 mundanity of that is is terrifying, and and obviously the music. I mean, the, you just can't. I don't. I don't know. I'm I'm very partial to it because it's the music of like my youth, and so I I I love that time. I love the cues, and I love the the fun of getting to twist those things, um, and subvert them, um, in in fun ways. So yeah, it was a blast. Yeah. Oh gosh. Um, yeah. Walking on set was uh really really exciting. I mean, I mean, it just yeah to twist things like that. I mean, LM is just ex extremely extraordinary. I mean, I knew that from the get from research. <laughs> I just knew I knew we were about to go on a, a wild ride. So listen, when I saw the trailer and heard the music, it and, and I'm like, whoa, oh okay. I mean, I knew. Because every day for me was on a hundred, so I just knew that this thing would just keep on going, and the, I mean, the '90s is just so awesome, and to be able to bend these things that we love, that we grew up on, that that we have these fond memories, um, 
the nostalgia of it all, I mean, it's just so exciting. I mean, just watching the screening of it, it was just like, whoa, mm -hmm. you know, for me, I'm just so grateful to be a part of this. This is like out of control. And I mean, it just, it's so elevated. You think uh, it's out of control. Here <laughs> in LA is playing a Bobby Womack song Listen. that I'm singing background on. <laughs> And that was my first job in Los Angeles when I rode into town on my family's hunting jeep. Mm -hmm. And I was singing on background my first job for tuition. And there it is in the scene with Deborah. <laughs> grinding, yeah. slow, slow <laughs> dragging, grinding, kissy facing to my song. And I'm a star. You think you a starving student out of work, LM? I was living in my aunt's garage on La Brea that looked like a tiki lounge, sleeping <laughs> on the sofa with the garage door going up and down, up and down. And I get a call from Bobby Womack to sing on a song that's in. And I thought you were doing it like for homage to Bobby Womack. I and didn't you even have to point it out. It gives me chills because I remember. No, I never will forget it. It was playing, and then De and just like like nothing. Pam turns to me. She's like, "Oh, that's me." And I'm like, literally. "Wait, what?" Literally, <laughs> literally, Truly. that was a crazy day. Like I was getting ready for the scene, and this beautiful song comes on, and we're using this song as like inspiration for the scene, and it's perfect. And literally, she's like, "Oh yeah, I have some background on that." But literally, Pam, you have stories like this for days. Like that's why I'm being quiet. <laughs> I don't know. for days. Don't I see it don't and be. listen to you, and it's just so dope. And just yeah, this this it's just been a very like beautiful, nostalgic, just uh, experience, honestly. And especially like with it being in the '90s, like it just doesn't feel removed. And like like you said, to kind of twist things that was so near and dear and not removed it feels even creepier and just it just is really I, I just yeah by the I way Joshua like, Joshua if you're confused the 90s were the decade before <laughs> you were born the 1900s sir. it's the, <laughs> it's the 1900s, late 1900s. Like, I was just about to say like I feel like I'm the only one that was uh born in <laughs> um but like nah like like just seeing a whole 90s nostalgic thing like it's just like it was really like eye opening to me because like I mean y'all lived through it but like you know I was just coming in the world you know what I'm saying like I was coming okay. in the world years later so it was kind of different but it was you were conceived that is so depressing that's <laughs> it's actually just depressing I like the 2000s you know what I'm saying that's, that's my yeah. you have no idea if you if you lived in the 90s you would like 2000s <laughs> yeah seriously I would agree to that I would agree to that but just seeing just seeing how it was back then and the music and everything it was fire so like just me seeing that on set it was just amazing to, to, to yeah. work. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And I don't think I'll ever listen to that Bobby Womack song the same way ever again now that I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, with the romantic songs of that time, a lot of uh, uh, Josh were conceived. They were still slow dancing. Mm -hmm. They were still hugging. And okay. it was a time where Sly and the Family Stone, Bobby Womack, you know, you had Jimi Hendrix. There was a time of inclusion mm -hmm. and others were trying to break it apart. And mm -hmm. that's when you could feel that tension. And we were really clinging to each other mm -hmm. for that's our cool. own identity or for our own music and culture and our, our clothing and our hair. Mm -hmm. And those, those were for me, uh, mm -hmm. very memorable. Mm. I cry just being back with Pam. I cried every day on set with Pam. Now I'm going to do it again. <laughs> this is Pam Greer. This is so crazy. Real. <laughs> That's so real. Like what you mentioned about like, sorry, we're going to touch it, but when you talk about like the love of that time and the fact that this series like is grounded in love and grounded in family and mm. just how much, you know, each family from the first season to the second are fighting to love each other. They're fighting for their love. And it's like, you know, when you hear these songs, you really put that into perspective that you, there's their love songs, but you hear a fighting. They're fighting through so much just to be together, you know? And it's just, yeah, to hear you say that, it actually is, is, is really, really deep. You know, it's really deep and it makes you put into perspective how much they fought through to be able to just love each other. It gives me the chills because I, many of us can't not remember the last time we slow danced with right. someone 
after mm-hmm. dinner at a party or a jam downstairs in the basement, everyone's slow jamming and they're, the guys are breathing into our straight hair and it's nappy by the time we leave the party. <laughs> um, and, you know, you, you're getting a little hot, you know, we can feel the room, okay? Yeah. Hot and Ms. heavy. Pam, Ms. Pam. Hot and heavy. Pam, Pam it's only 8.30 in the morning, it's in the morning Pam. Pam. I absolutely, yeah, like, miss, I miss them. I miss those days. If we hold hand now, so that's important to me. And you, LM, brought a lot of those, evoked so much of that. And mm. people constantly are playing the 45s and the music yeah. that we revisit and go, remember that? And we conceived our son Joshua on that song, on that slow jam. <laughs> and the fact that it was a real expression of the songs of that era that you can go, you may not hear them today. They hear them on country, but back in the day, man, it was a love fest. Mm. It was even in church. I can Mm. hear the church in it because I was in a gospel group at the time, Earth, Wind and Fire, three members of them are from Denver. And a lot of their songs and what we were singing about was pure community and love in Mm. spite of everything that was going on we were going to embrace one another and mm-hmm. enjoy it, the differences. And I am just enamored yeah. by working with all of you and, and LM bringing me into the fold and, and, and uh, letting me share so many years and decades with you before you were born, during things that were so incredibly political and mm-hmm. uh, denying to women Mm-hmm. And to see the changes today, just, you know, I am, I wake up breathing, just reborn. Because at the time I always thought of, it's got to be more than hope. We are more than hope. And yeah. it is here and I'm experiencing it with all of you. All the work you've done, here we are. Thank you. Because without you, that change wouldn't be possible. Right on. That's what we felt every day that we were with you. Like right it, there's a direct line um, from this show to every stride you took, every leap you took, your bravery. You know, there's there's a direct line from you to everything that came after. So yeah. thank you for that. Hi, Dana Abercrombie. Dana Abercrombie, the Coalition. My question for you, uh, um, LM, is the season one was very black and white in terms of who us versus them is. In season two, it's a bit more ambiguous. So I wanted to know, kind of building that around the backdrop of the 90s in Los Angeles at that time. Yeah, I, 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 I'm i fascinated by LA. I'm fascinated, like endlessly fascinated by it as a city. I'm endlessly fascinated by its history. And I'm I'm fascinated by the ways in which it, um, if you look at those 30 years between the first season and the second season, I'm fascinated by the ways in which the city has shifted and changed, but also by the ways it remains the same. Um, and how the way people are living in the 90s is as a direct result of some of the historical things you saw happening in that first season. So watching the evolution of a city was very important to me. Um, At the same time, I'm also, as Deb said beautifully, the show is always about family. And I'm endlessly fascinated by family dynamics. I'm also um, endlessly fascinated by family histories and the way in which um, our histories play out inside of us, whether we're cognizant of that or not, um, and how we can't escape where we come from. Um, and in beautiful ways and in, in our show, in our case, sometimes in terrifying ways or heartbreaking ways. Mm-hmm. So getting to sort of navigate all of that um, was very exciting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Derek Dunn, Reviews and Dunn. I had a question for uh, Mr. James. What was your prep process for this role as it's kind of dark based on stuff you've done in the past? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um. <laughs> Wow, man, I was flying at the seat of my pants. <laughs> um, I, uh, whoa. Interesting. I was, before I got this opportunity, I was doing a Christmas movie with Kirk Franklin. Okay. <laughs> Completely different worlds. I have never done anything like this. I think the, I think the most, the wildest thing that I've ever done is Broadway. Like just the idea of just being on stage for 90 minutes and you're going, right? And the audience owes you nothing. I've never done it before. And it's just out of control. I thought that would be like, oh, that's, yeah, that's the best echelon of it all. 
Nah, L L L M L M rock my world in the best ways. In the best ways, like truly, it was truly freeing because I got to really, really be a kid. Like the the kid that people would pe when people watch this, those who really know me will see it and say, "See, <laughs> that's the Luke. That's the Luke that nobody knows." Because in a, in a, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit uh morbid and uh I have a bit of a morbid uh comedic uh side of myself that of course I just can't give to everyone but man when I met little Marvin I could just pour it out to him and we were just pouring into each other and it was just back and forth and I'm an only child and I remember all of my childhood I remember everything and mm -hmm. it was just it was just awesome to 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 come with this this bag of knowledge that I've had that I've accumulated over the years. And here's a project that I get to pour all of that into, you know, everything else that I've done it, music. Yes. Music side and other things I, I had to imagine and pull from other places. But from this, I just had to really dig deep into my own truth. Um, and it's interesting how LM and I relate in our upbringings and, and what we were into and the, how much of eyeballs we were. I was a loner as a kid, still kind of a loner. I'm getting better with it. <laughs> it was just fun, man. It was really, really fun. It was really opportunity as an artist. You know, like, I think things like this, um, the spontaneity of it all, it's like you you do this stuff in class, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 you work and work years and years and years and years to get an opportunity like this. And I'm just I'm just so grateful for this. I mean, it was just absolutely fun. So I just came with a, a well full of ideas that I would never share with anyone because I'm in fear of them, you know, uh, not being my friend or whatever. Um yeah, but LM just took me in and just like, yeah, go with that. And he was throwing mm -hmm. things at me. I was like, huh, yes, I go with that. Well, I have to, that. That was easy to do because of, of yeah, I have to say that I was actually making a joke before we started this that I never met Luke James. Like I met his character is Edmund Gaines. I met Luke Gaines. <laughs> I met this weird hybrid version of Luke and the character. And I don't like this guy I'm looking at on the screen is not the guy I hung out with for six months <laughs> and made that show. It's just not him. The guy I see singing, it's just not him. It was mm -hmm. like, he, and he came in, I have to tell you, like a bat out of hell. On the first day, we threw him this scene, his very first scene. I can't say what it is, but it was insane. I turned to our first AD. I'm like, surely we can give him something else. She's like, there is nothing else. It's all crazy. <laughs> so he's going to have to just jump into crazy. And when I tell you the way he embraced that scene from day one, it put the entire crew at ease. It put everyone, everyone just breathed a sigh of relief because it was like, oh my God, like, here he is, we're in good hands. There was a joke when we were writing it around the writer's table, we were just like, we just kept stopping. We're like, who's playing this? <laughs> <laughs> Who on earth is playing this role? And then the perfect person walks in and- Yes. It's yes. magic. I'm so grateful. It was therapeutic, okay? Let me let me say, it it it, it was. It was just- Your bill, was, has you, have, you, have, you, have you gotten the bill yet? Because the bill is coming. <laughs> <laughs> Not got the that was six months of sessions, right? I changed, I changed my address. I knew that <laughs> was coming. <laughs> it was extremely fun. It, it was, was extremely fun. It, it, it's a, a dream, a dream come true. Truly, I, 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 that's that's what I can say. It really was. Hello, this is Karan Lenoir Kelly with Karanism.com and Love Music Pleasure. First, give an honor to who it is due, Miss Pam Greer. Mm. It's a pleasure to be in your presence. All of you, all the dignitaries in the room, I give you respect. <laughs> now, there's a purity about this horror. It is definitely horror, but there's a purity about it because it provokes so much of what we are really afraid of in humanity and in nature's response to it. So I'm curious what you're afraid of and what did you learn about your fears? And this is for all of you. The hmm. tallest one goes first. <laughs> that's you, Pam. You tower over us all. That's, that's you. <laughs> what frightened me most is the fact that I can lose my daughter and my grandson because of a very dark secret that can just 
is not when you see the abandonment of of of, of a heart and soul um a love being passed away that to me is horror that is pain very painful to love and then not love and so with the the mother the character that i portray the abandonment to me is is horrific and knowing that my my secret could just I could lose my family. I'm losing my my youth, my mental state. I'm losing so much, and I don't know where to go, whom to talk to. And when I would see Deborah in the teaser in the tub, and I don't recognize her, that scene was crushing to me. That's my worst fear: losing someone I deeply loved. Not being seen not being loved outside mm -hmm. of oneself, uh, to not have anybody, to feel alone in this world, mm -hmm. um, to never hear, to never have the opportunity to hear someone else say, I love you, mm -hmm. I see you, give me a hug, uh, that's that's scary to me. My deepest fear is drowning. I think that there's a sense of like losing control. You know, um, you can't hold on to anything. Everything just seems to slip out of your hands and you can't breathe and you can't, you know, um, that for me is such a deep, deep fear. Um, for me personally, and I think really for, for Dawn as well, is that kind of not having control, you know, um, in the series, you kind of see her dealing with something that she doesn't really know what it is. Cause if you know what it is and you can, you can deal with it, but she doesn't. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that, that is a humongous fear for me is not having that control and just drowning. Yeah. I think I think that um, one of my personal biggest fears is just not being able to reach my full potential uh, in any in anything like in any aspect. Um, just having that just run through the back of my mind like constantly is just like really fearful to me. It's like like what it's it's a bunch of what ifs. So like mm -hmm. being able to not control those what ifs, like just always having that in the back of your mind, is just mm -hmm. stressful, you know. But yeah, that's 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 one of my biggest fears for sure. Ah, uh, you're gonna be just fine, Josh. Yes, you are. I, I can tell you, we don't share that fear for you. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> you well, go. Make that. Yes. I want to echo what um what Luke said because I I think that that's at the heart of the story actually in many ways is this is that fear and particularly that the not being seen and the not knowing it's it's both there's two halves to the story and it's Deb's they both said it beautifully, Deb's half of not knowing and feeling like you're drowning with that not knowing. And then Luke's half, which is not being seen and not feeling loved and the deep well that that can cause and the rage that can cause and the horrible decisions that that can cause. And, you know, there's the old adage that hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I, I think Luke's character, and I think to some degree Deb's character, I think both sides of the story are are sort of dealing with that mm -hmm. in their own way, whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I think that that fear really is at the heart of the scare this season. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It was a brilliant that, season, a brilliant performance. By the way, Karen, I loved how you like waved your way in. I'm going to adopt this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. I'm here all week. <laughs> Everyone, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. This is a phenomenal uh, franchise series. We love it. And we just can't keep uh, wait to keep seeing more and more and more. But congratulations to all of you on this uh, season two. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. On behalf of the world's largest group of Black film and TV critics, thank you for watching this edition of After Roundtables. Have a great day. As well.
Hey, I look forward to seeing you soon.